Um, I just wanted to introduce briefly our final speaker for the day, um, Professor Sir John Pullman, who has asked me to um, give a, a, a short and sweet introduction, so uh, there you right. go. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Patrick. Um, so I wanted a short introduction, so I'm actually going to say something about um, what I've done uh, it, as part of my talk. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. So any, anyway, um, uh, this is going to be about chemistry teaching in a broad sort of way, because as you can tell, I've been around for a long time, um, and uh, I've been quite a lot involved in chemistry teaching, mostly south of the border, I'm sorry to say, but I have some reflections to make that maybe are quite international. So I hope, hope that's what I'm going to um, be able to uh, keep your attention with. If you get bored or just want to ask a question, just ask it. Okay, then let's, then let's wait to the end. Uh, let's, let's try and make it uh, interactive. So, I, I said, I said I, this is why I um, told Patrick that I didn't want a, a long introduction, because I'm going to just tell you some of my personal landmarks, because they, they illustrate the sort of things that I'm interested in. So, I started life as a chemistry teacher, look at that, 1967, and that was when I first started uh, teaching chemistry age 20. And uh, I went on being a chemistry teacher, did quite a lot of biology and physics teaching as well. Um, <clears throat> and then between 1984 and 1994, I sort of went part-time, and I was very lucky that I had some secondments um, and went and worked for various organisations, including the English government, um, on, on the curriculum, and I wrote quite a few books. And then um, I was a school principal <coughs> um, for six years, from 94 to 2000. Um, and then a very interesting thing happened. I got the opportunity to go to the University of York as a professor of chemical education, quite a niche sort of a chair. Um, and that gave me the wonderful experience of teaching in uh, universities, which is a strange experience for a school teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first time I walked into a lecture theatre with 150 students in, and they were all listening to me, <laughs> it was um, exactly unbelievable. And also, what was the obvious idea to me, but didn't appear to be to any other lectures, which was to stand outside your lecture theatre and say hello to everyone as they came in. <laughs> that was quite transformational as well. Um, then, uh, between 2004, um, uh, I set up the National Science Learning Centre, which is in the University of York, and it's for the whole of the UK. Folks, if you can get down to the National Science Learning Centre, it's two and a half hours from Edinburgh, a little bit more from Glasgow, and um, there is great opportunity to take part in professional development there. So I set that up between 2000 2010, and then I had a period when I was the English government's uh, science advisor. Then I retired, and um, I became the education advisor to the Gatsby Foundation, which is big for charitable trust. And I got very involved in talking, in um, researching about career guidance and studying how that was done overseas. And quite a lot of what I want to talk to you about is things I've learned from overseas. Um, and then, currently, um, I'm chair of a social mobility charity. I was president of the RSC, very proud to be the first RSC president from a school background. Um, and I uh, hope there'll be, there'll be more in the future because teaching chemistry is every bit as important as making great research discoveries. In fact, you can't do the second without the first. Uh, and I'm now president of the, of the Association for Science Education. So that's me. Um, I spent a lot of my time teaching chemistry, in my early career, teaching chemistry uh, in a school near London called Watford Grammar School. And uh, I was head of chemistry there. But one day I was turning out my office, I had a little office, no windows, um, a very pokey little place, but I was very proud of it, it was mine. And I was turning it out one day, and I thought, I'll have a look on the top of that cupboard. So it was, it was a big cupboard. Looked at the top, and I found a cylinder, a cylindrical sort of card object, but quite heavy. Shook it, rattled a little bit, looked inside, pulled out a metal object, with fins on it and German writing. <laughs> and I thought this looked very much like a bomb. <laughs> it was about that long. So it was that. Uh, anyway, it was six o'clock and I wanted to go home. So I thought it's been here probably since 1940. Uh, so it'd be all right for a bit longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went home, um, locked the door. On the way out, I saw the caretaker and he, he said, I said, Bill, 
just one thing I found a bomb in the office. Um, <laughs> Don't touch it. Don't touch it. <laughs> anyway, he quite rightly made me do something about it, um, which I wouldn't have done. Uh, anyway, cut a long story short, the bomb disposal people came, said this is a World War II incendiary bomb. Uh, we will have to detonate it, um, which they did in the middle of morning break. <laughs> with a thousand students all around the field, watching and cheering, and certainly it went up. Um, and they said, yeah, it, that was a century bomb when it was live. Um, so anyway, it happened that a few weeks later I met my predecessor, um, who, was, who was by then retired actually. And I said to him, Jeff, um, you know, funny thing, I was turning out the office the other day and I found a World War II bomb. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, you know, I, I got it disposed of. Uh, bomb disposed of, you can blow it up. He said, what? He said that was a visual aid. We used to use that. <laughs> we were used teaching oxidation and reduction. Magnesium, potassium perchlorate, you know, the, the oxidant, the reductant, and you blow this up and that's the end. I, I couldn't explain to him that it wasn't really very good. It, it got into the local paper actually. Didn't it? I said, you know, I, I am going to talk about chemistry um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about chemistry teaching and I want to talk about things that don't change things that do change but keep going backwards and forwards, uh, and things that go in one direction. So that's what it's basically going to be about. Whether I'll get through it all depends um, on how, many, how much discussion we have. Um, and then the last point is, and just in case I never get to it, um, the last point is about unintended consequences. Um, because whenever you make a change in any kind of policy, things happen that you didn't mean to happen. Uh, and um, there are examples here in Scotland, as there are examples in every country in the world. I hope I can get to talk about some of those in a minute. Just, just before I do get into this, um, I do want to um, just reflect on the fact that, that this country is, this country, I mean Scotland, but I also mean the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, is very good at science education. So uh, let's be quite clear about that. This is the PISA study, you know, the International League Table, um, done in, uh, this was the 2015 um, study, uh, which focused particularly on science, 15 year olds for science. So here we are. Um, the, the three criteria that they, were, that they were measuring for this particular study was how much do kids enjoy science, how well do they do in it, and do they expect to go into a science career? And it turns out that of the 80 odd nations that took part in PISA, about seven um, f fell into the top group of those three categories. So it's a kind of sweet spot of being good at science, enjoying it, and wanting to, to go on with it. And there are the uh, yeah, seven countries that fall into that sweet spot, and the UK is one of them. Just one other thing about that, um, the UK is by far the largest country, and when you're, when you're trying to excel in these international comparisons, the bigger you are, the harder it is to do because of, because of the greater diversity in larger nations. So there we are, something to be proud of. The other thing to note is that I think all of the other countries have got populations around 5 million. Population Scotland. Countries with small, or is it 7 million in Scotland? About that. Countries with. You know, that sort of quite small population often do extremely well in education. Of course, I'm fully aware that Scotland does. But that's an aggregated result for PISA. While I'm talking about PISA, and I will get on with the talk soon, I just wanted to show you this, which is a, an analysis from PISA 2006. So this is, it was a focus on science. And what we've done is to take um, the score in other words, attainment, and put that along the x-axis. So this is how well the countries do. But then they've taken um, a measure of interest in science and put it up the y-axis. So countries down at the bottom right-hand side have got high scores in science, but low interest. And the countries up the top left-hand top left side um, have got low scores but high interest. Look at that negative correlation. <coughs> so we've got countries like Finland, famously successful educationally, down the bottom, bottom right, very high attainment, not very high interest. 
Then up there on the, on the top left, countries like Brazil, Mexico, not very high attainment, very high interest. Now we could spend the rest of the lecture talking about the reasons for that, and I'm, I'm sure you've got all sorts of thoughts about why that might be. All, all I would say is that some of the methods for getting high attainment, not necessarily in PISA, but some of the methods for getting high attainment run the risk of killing interest if you are constantly preparing for tests and examinations. I'm not saying that's the explanation for that, but I'm using it as a kind of illustration. Anyone want to say anything at, at this stage, or just pause, get my breath back? I just wanted to ask, um, those with the high attainment, how many, is there any, any um, statistics, how many of those students then go on to there, there are no statistics from, from that particular from that particular study. There are some from that one I showed you earlier, where we're, where we're in the sweet spot, because of one of the ways of interest in a career in science is plotting over time whether they actually took up. Yeah, because I was thinking if they're not interested, if they've lost interest by that time, then they're not going to take it further, even though they've got high schools. So does that have an actual impact on attainment of science at further education? Yeah, it, and, and that's, that is critical. I'm going to touch on that point, I hope, in a minute. So let's talk about things that don't change. Um, and for me, uh, the two critical things are the importance of teachers and the importance of practical work. Um, the Wellcome Trust uh, has a, a study which it does, I think, every three years called the Science Education Tracker. Um, and they, they surveyed about uh, 4,000 youngsters aged 14 to 18 but this is from 2016 and they said to them amongst many other things um, what do you, what make what, what should, makes you interested in science what is the reason that students are interested in science and the leading factors uh, turned out as it happens both to be 35 percent of the students saying that the leading the one leading factor was having a good teacher and doing practical work um, it is a coincidence that, that, that it's the same score, but it kind of tells you something, because everyone knows that a good teacher is the most important thing. Um, but doing practical work is really, really important. So th these are two things that don't change. I just want to say a bit more about the importance of good teachers. Um, until quite recently, I uh, always taught the first year at the University of York, first year chemistry and biochemistry and natural sciences. Uh, this group was 259, there they are. Um, and every year I used to ask them um, why they um, went to study chemistry at university. Not, not just the University of York, why did you come to any university to study chemistry? So it's, it, it's, it's your point, the point that you were making just now. Um, and those are the things that I offered them. Anyone want to guess what came bottom? Parents. Parents, okay, yep. And what can top? Uh, several, several suggestions. Okay, here they come. Uh, marks out of five, five is the highest. Um, so, um, the, the, the most popular reason why they just wanted to study chemistry was a teacher. Interesting, the, se the second highest are the job prospects. Um, this is true everywhere, but particularly when you're paying 9,000 quid a go <laughs> in an English university, um, the job prospects are quite important. Um, let's see, where did parents come? Um, yeah, quite low. The lowest was what? What your friends were choosing. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I hope they were honest in uh, giving this answer. Uh, it's always amusing some of the other things that they tell me. Some, some funny, um, some quite touching. Uh, so, there's someone who um, chose chemistry because he, I expect it was a he, uh, was watching Breaking Bad when he chose his university courses. Uh, another one had a crazy year nine teacher. Um, but then, you know, <laughs> So, they're really quite touching things about someone in the family, and that's not just a one off. Someone in the family was ill. They really thought, if I could understand something, if I could study something, I might be able to find a way to find a cure for that. And then a lot of people just say they love it. And uh, why not? You know, I love chemistry. I don't mind admitting that. I think it's a great subject. Um, so that's, that, that was quite interesting. Now, coming back to the very important question of teachers. I've visited Finland quite a few times. I'm sorry to keep using the 
F word, but it really is a very significant country in education because they are very, very successful. Um, and you know, you, you can you can ask why, and it is about the teachers. Um, for first of all, teaching is highly respected, and because of that, I'm not saying it isn't here, by the way, but it really is extraordinary. It's almost the kind of national industry. Um, and because of that, it's highly competitive to become a teacher. And um, it's a sort of one, one in ten success rate in applying. The teachers are very autonomous, very much trusted by the parents and the system. Um, they're very highly trained. All teachers have masters. Um, and they, they are very, very good at their subject. Um, because they've had a, a, probably two extra years compared to a UK teacher. Um, to hone both their subject knowledge and their, their pedagogy. Um, and also they have career-long professional development. So they've got, they got CPD, what's the, what's the term here? CLPL. CLPL, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they have that all, all through their career and it's very systematic. So they are constantly upgrading their, their subject knowledge. Now, actually, I think that quite a lot of those factors apply here in Scotland, actually. Um, I mean, you have got, I, I don't know how it works in practice, but you have the idea of career-long professional development is actually embedded in the conditions of service of, of teachers. You know, the, the quality may be varied, and maybe there isn't enough subject-specific professional development, I don't know. But I think quite a lot of those, the, those features are up here in Scotland, but maybe there's a few pointers there that um, the old ministers might be interested in in the long term. When I was president of the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, one of the last things I did was to hold a, um, a kind of seminar for future career leaders, sorry, future chemistry leaders in secondary schools. Quite a lot came from Scotland, of course. Um, and the guest speaker, the, the sort of star speaker, was Ben Faringa. That's Ben Faringa on the right, um, who got, his, got the Nobel Prize 2015 for his work on molecular motors, these little tiny molecular motors that crawl around your arteries and clear up all the blocks. And he gave a great quote during his talk. Uh, and his talk was about being an inspiring teacher and how he had been inspired, and that was why he got into chemistry. Uh, and he said, I wish every young person could have at least one inspiring teacher in their time at school. It, it, it didn't say an inspiring chemistry teacher, you know, just one, someone who will light that fire. And I'm sure we're all here thinking, we can think of someone who, who, who lit that fire. And it does make such a difference. And um, in, in, because I've been teaching for a long time, I have had one or two letters, not all that many, but one or two letters from people in the past who um, you know, gave that message about being, being inspired at school in lessons. And it's a great moment when you get that. So teachers are the number one. But another thing that um, I don't think changes uh, is about the importance of practical work uh, in teaching chemistry. Uh, and I want to say a bit more about that because I did a study for the Gatsby Foundation um, on practical science. And it was an international comparative study. I went to six countries and compared how they do practical work in those six countries. Uh, and from that, we published a set of benchmarks. So the, the report's up there on the web, good Gatsby, good practical science. And if you want a hard copy, um, just drop me an email and I'll, and I'll make sure that you, you get one. It's got some guidance for what internationally um, world-class practice in, in practical sciences. Those are the countries that we visited. We chose them because they were you know, sort of successful, effective countries um, as measured by PISA and other scores. Um, and there were, there were a lot of interesting um, dialogues that we had with teachers and pupils, um, head teachers, ministers, um, about practical science. And that's, that's just one of them. I only picked one out. Teacher in Massachusetts in a school in Boston, very diverse school. Quite a lot of very recently arrived immigrants from Central America who didn't, didn't speak English at all um, and were sort of almost dazed at the prospect of uh, at the reality of being in this school and being taught and everything going on in a different language. And it was a wonderful school of dealing, for, dealing with those, those sort of language problems. And, this person said, to create a shared experience, we do practical work. Students advise with very different sets of home experiences, but an experiment 
creates a level playing field. And is, there is no, if, you're, if everyone's doing the same experiment, there's no advantage to someone who comes from a, from a home where there are lots of books and people are always talking about science and they're being taken to museums and things like that. If you're all doing the same experiment, it's a level playing field and you're all starting in the same place. I thought that was quite a striking thing to say. Um, the, so from, from, from this study uh, of six, uh, six countries, we created ten benchmarks. Uh, I don't expect you to read them all, but they are the kind of um, criteria that you need to reach uh, if you're going to have good practical science. Um, and I've, I've just picked out from those um, some of the, of the very key points. Um, the first is that it seems that students getting their hands on things is a very important part of their engagement with it and their ability to develop skills. That sounds obvious, but in, in some, of, some countries that I've visited, not these ones, um, the classes are so big that it's just not possible to have everyone doing an experiment, and so demonstrations become more common. But hands-on is um, essential uh, if, if you're going to have real impact for practical work. The next one is about technicians. And you have technicians in Scottish schools, don't you? Yeah. 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 Interestingly, I've visited six countries. Three of them, they don't have technicians at all. And three, they don't. Coincidence, obviously. But that's a, that's a measure that, that technicians aren't the norm in developed countries. For example, in the U USA, no lab technicians. Finland, no lab technicians. And in Finland, the teachers get the experiments ready themselves and wash up, clear away. They get paid extra to do it. Doesn't seem very efficient to me, but that, that's, that's, the way, that's the way that they do it. So we are, we are fortunate here in um, the UK having technicians. And um, I, th I think head teachers, principals, need reminding uh, that um, that if they do away with technicians or try and cut down the technician workforce, it's a false economy because they'll almost certainly have to pay for it in some other way. In the USA, most of the labs I've visited have got their own little prep room, their own little preparation room, because the teacher goes off and gets the experiment ready and then comes out again so that she doesn't have to go down the corridor to, to get all the stuff. So it's a false economy doing away with them. The third thing I discovered is that digital technology, to my surprise, is not taking over. It's not replacing science. I want to say some, uh, say, uh, sorry, it's not replacing hands-on practical work. And I'm going to say some more about that later on. Um, the fourth point is about risk. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'll say, I'll say a little bit more about that again. But the fifth point I wanted to make is about projects. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a big enthusiast for student projects, investigations which the students have control over. Um, now, I think you do those in advanced hires. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. They're great. They're a lot of work. Technicians often don't like them because of all the work and all the mess. Um, but for me, and this is from both personal experience and international experience, I think they're the, as good as it gets. When they, when, they're, when they work well. There's two students in the Netherlands. Now in the Netherlands, if you're on a, a, a program leading to university, which is about half the students in the country, you have to do an 80-hour project. It's called the Profiel Werkstuck, which you can translate as masterpiece. It's the student's masterpiece. This is the thing that they do um, towards the end of their pre-university courses. These two girls, um, were doing a, a, a project on the human voice and seeing if they could de detect differences in the acoustic profile of the voice depending on ethnicity. And it was you know, a really interesting question. Obviously, any difference is going to be quite small. And so they, they, they were very um, effective at, at, uh, at handling the need for sensitivity. Um, so because everyone's got to do one of these, um, and because it takes 80 hours, they're pretty significant, and there's a lot of it goes on. And for example, universities have hotlines um, where students can ring up and give me some help with my profile for And I think you were saying, Debbie, that, that you do that here in Strathclyde, don't you? And that's great. Um, great superb support for, for schools. Um, and they have a national competition, um, uh, which is run by the Dutch equivalent of the Royal Society. 
and uh, every year the best of all the profil Wirkstücks are entered and they have a sort of grand prize giving uh, competition uh, each year. So that, that's the best I've seen anywhere. It's really good. I wish we had it in England, certainly. Um, you've, got, you've, got, you've got the beginning of it in Scotland. Hold on to it. Um, okay, so that's the things that don't change. Does anyone, to, anyone want to say anything? Okay. Um, I want to talk briefly about things that, that sort of swing backwards and forwards. Um, and the first and um, most, in some ways, painful one is the science curriculum and, uh, and its assessment. I just want to tell you a little bit um, about my own experience. So this is slightly self-indulged because I'm going to take you back to 1988. 1988 was the year um, that England carried out its Great Education Reform Act. And there I am. I got the call. Look at that. Look at that hair. I bet you can't pick me out from, from all the world. <laughs> That's me in 1988 with fantastic hair. Um, and I got the call from uh, someone in the education department saying, would I come and help them write the National Curriculum for Science? Um, and this was part of this big education act. And this was the first time that England had had a national curriculum. But until then, it, it was all over the place and schools could teach um, almost anything and sometimes nothing. So this was a great moment for me, and as Wordsworth said, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. That was me. He was talking about the French Revolution, which had some unintended consequences, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because the reality about the national curriculum was, um, the national curriculum for England and Wales, uh, it was created in 1989, um, but it went through, how many is that, nearly 10 other versions, many of them coming straight after 1989, as the problems with it became apparent, because it was introduced for 100% of the population. There was no piloting at all. Um, and so you can see all the versions that it ran through, it began to slow down a bit um, towards 2008, and then in 2013, there was a very big change uh, to the National Curriculum for England, and that's the one that they follow now. Um, now, I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail because it is fantastically detailed, um, but uh, I, I just want to point out one or two th reasons why the curriculum, the science curriculum, does tend to have this pendulum effect. And this is a quote from Barack Obama, who's basically saying that science is more than just facts and knowledge and theories. It's about a way of looking at the world. And we all know that. Science is a set of skills and processes and looking at the world and finding evidence that's different from other ways. And it's got its own discipline, its own way of doing things. And of course, it's the most fantastic way that humans have discovered of looking at the world, if you're a, if you're a scientist and we all are. Um, so that, that, I think, is the reason why the science curriculum in England, anyway, uh, is, tends to be quite controversial. Um, for example, when the, uh, the, the national curriculum was turned into um, exams equivalent to your national fives, the GCSEs in England, um, there was a lot of attack on it by, by scientists as being, oh, this is fit for the pup, you know, we get kind of people going, do, doing the sort of science that, that anyone can talk about without any prior knowledge. And, the, and there's always a, going to be a risk that if you do have a curriculum that is about the methods of science, that people will attack it for not having enough of the knowledge and facts about science. So it's always a balancing act. At present, the National Curriculum for England has gone quite strongly towards knowledge. Some people would say too much. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the pendulum went back a bit sometime. I hope not for another 10 years or more. Um, but there's one other thing, and I think I can detect um, this, some results of this happening uh, here in uh, Scotland. I just realised I haven't... Can you see me? Yeah. 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 
It's called. Cool. Um, when, when you're studying science to the age of 16, in the compulsory um, science, uh, there are actually two things that it needs to do. There will be some people who want to go on and study science as a special subject in your hires, A levels in England, pre pre university. They will need some some kind of things in their curriculum that perhaps the majority don't need. The, the majority being those who are using science as part of their general general literacy, scientific literacy. So it's like being numerate, it's like being literate, scientifically literate as well. And I think you'd all agree that as in a democratic society, we all need to have some understanding, some grounding in, in science. Um, just think of issues around climate change, for example. And a lot of the issues that we have around the science curriculum is trying to reconcile those two things. Now, I'm no expert in what's happening here with the curriculum for excellence, but I, I did go to Fraser's session uh, in which he was talking about multi-course teaching. And the, it, it does seem to me extraordinary the challenges that teachers here face because you're trying to teach more than one uh, type of course within a single class. And that seems to me to be a result of trying, and, you know, it's perfectly valid, we've got to do it, we've got to serve both groups, parents won't thank us if, if, if it's just for, for the minority or if it's just for the majority needs the minority out. It's got to be done. But one of the big conundrums about the science curriculum is trying to make it a, a possible for, for everyone. Um, very briefly, I'd just like to say, and I'm going to move off the curriculum then, um, I'd just like to say that um, I hope the curriculum won't be changed in England anytime soon. I don't know what the solution is to the issues here in Scotland. But one day there will be a move to revise the curriculum. There has to be because science changes very quickly. And um, in the background, the three major scientific societies, Royal Society of Chemistry, Institute of Physics, Royal Society of Biology, and the Association for Science Education, are working, thank you, um, are working to kind of anticipate the next iteration of the, uh, of the curriculum. And there's some very interesting work going on to try and define what the curriculum should contain, so that it really does reflect modern physics, chemistry, and biology. But as I say, that's for the future because it's far too early to change things yet. I'm going to skip that um, and just talk a bit about the things that go in one direction. Um, and these on the whole are things that affect chemistry teaching that I, I approve of the direction that they're going. And I, I want to just give you three examples. And one is um, technology. Uh, technology is slowly making an impact on the classroom, the chemistry classroom. But what surprises me is how slow it is. When you look at the impact that computer technology has had on, for example, medicine, the office, most workplaces actually, the impact that it's had on education is really very small. And if you go into the, the, the classroom of today in the UK, and indeed almost anywhere in the world, you'll find very little that has fundamentally changed. The fundamental transaction is a human being standing in, standing in front of a class. And it kind of makes you wonder um, why that is. Uh, and when I went on my trips around the world looking at um, practical work, uh, I saw lots of scenes like that. So it's not as if it's had no effect. Um, but I saw far more scenes which were students putting their hands on, on equipment uh, and, and uh, with, with not a computer in sight. My theory, and it is only a theory, I can't prove it, but I've kind of got a feeling that as the, the virtual world becomes more and more realistic and we can see more and more YouTube videos, we can see more and more holograms, we can see more and more realistic representations, actually getting your hands on the real thing 
is a kind of calibrating what's real versus what's, what's virtual. So my feeling is that actually authentic experience in the real world become more important as we get more and more technology rather than being less. And certainly from my observation of very advanced countries like Singapore, Massachusetts, Finland, um, I, that's, that confirms for me that if anything there's more hands-on experiments going on despite the advance of technology. Another thing that moves in one direction, uh, I'm glad to say, is health and safety, or at least the expectations of it. I'm not saying that accidents don't happen, but people's expected standards of health and safety have increased enormously in the time that I've been involved, involved in teaching, and they continue to do so. And it's, it, for me, it's a sign of a country's development, economic development, um, how strict and robust they are about health and safety. And I, I want to pay, um, I'm going to skip that bit, I want to pay tribute uh, to CERC uh, and its English equivalent, which is called CLEPS. CERC is the Scottish Science Equipment Research Centre, something like that. And they are the consult, the go -to, they're the go-to people if you want to know about health and safety in that, in that, so really good. And likewise, the English equivalent called CLEPS. And we are very lucky in this country, science teachers are very lucky, because in some countries, and I'm thinking particularly of the United States, there is, they're almost shutting down any experiments that are, have got any kind of possible hazard around them. And they're tending to use only sort of household chemicals, household ingredients, uh, because they have, no, they have no risk for them, but they also are really quite boring when you come, come to one of the interesting experiments. Um, so uh, it's very important to get a kind of balanced approach to health and safety. So the direction of expectations is that society expects <coughs> ever higher standards, quite rightly, but the risk that comes with it is that we get too risk averse and these organisations are guarding against that. Um, as time runs out, I won't have time to say as much as I wanted to about evidence-informed teaching, but I do believe that this is, a, this is another one-way one change um, and what I mean is, I detect that um, teachers here in Scotland, in England too, are becoming more and more aware of the research evidence that underpins what they're doing. Now often this is research evidence that confirms something they're already doing that they that kind of felt was the right thing to do. Um, but we're getting, the point is we're getting more and more research evidence and, and higher and higher quality. And for example, Fraser, you do a column with David Reed, don't you, exactly. in the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry's wonderful magazine, Education in Chemistry, and Fraser and David Reed's column is about what research is telling us. And I, I'm really pleased to see that the profile of research evidence in chemistry teaching is, is going up all the time. And, and I think that's a good thing because I think it raises the status of teachers, ultimately. If, if you think about medicine, it's completely rooted in, in evidence. And with that goes the huge professional respect that we have for doctors. I want teachers to have that same deep professional respect. And I believe one of the ways that we can get it is becoming a more and more evidence-rooted organisation. I just, because I haven't got time to go into the detail, I just um, inform you that uh, I did a study for a body called the Education Endowment Foundation. So if you Google this, it's, it's quite useful. It's got um, sort of summaries of research evidence about, about teaching, about science teaching. Um, a lot of it confirms things that you already knew, but it's great to know that there is a strong evidence base for things that, that you're doing. Um, let me just give you one example. Um, number one, uh, so there are seven there are seven key recommendations in this study and number one is about preconceptions build on the things that pupils bring with them um, and it's it's so important that one here is a picture uh, children were little children uh, primary school children were asked to draw a picture of what it looks like inside an egg and you know <laughs> some of them are clever some of them are funny um, but knowing for a teacher to know that the children she or he teaches have got those sort of conceptions in their head is useful. 
And it's always useful to try and get an understanding of what uh, your class have got in their head. I haven't got time to do uh, any more of those. Because uh, I do want to talk, unfortunately, about unintended consequences. Um, uh, because, as I said at the beginning, governments introduce new policies. At the time, they seem great, and they often are great, but things happen that weren't intended. And from my small understanding of your curriculum for excellence, I think there are things that happened with that that weren't intended. Um, and there have had to be changes. Um, my understanding is that it works because the teachers have made it work. Uh, and have gone the extra mile um, and worked to overcome problems that come with it. This is very, very familiar, not only in England too, but in other parts of the world. And to my mind, um, the answer to, oh, well, look, yeah, that, that's evidence, isn't there, uh, of implementation not always going well. But my, the answer for me, um, three musts for successful policy implementation, that you should pilot, Pilot. Pilot. You should always, if you're making a change to millions of young people's lives, uh, you should try it out first. And our national curriculum was never tried out uh, on any kind of sample. And you can see why politicians want to do things quickly, but you really must, because this is making huge differences to people's lives, as well as to the working conditions of teachers. So I'm going to stop there, because I do hope we'll have one or two thoughts coming from you. Thanks for this.